You're hanging out After Hours with Matt Anderson, presented by Inside the Gamecocks. What is going on, everybody? Um, happy to have you here tonight. Um, the rare double dip. We had a show last night with Alex Jones. Um, the the big spur Alex Jones, not not the crazy guy that lives in your social media. Or maybe he's actually banned from social media. I don't know. But anyway, long story short, um, we're going to have John Whittle on here in a little bit. I'm really excited for that. But I don't know if you guys have been watching college basketball tonight, but Vanderbilt just upset Texas A&M. Uh, if, if you had that on your bingo card, I did not. Uh, Vanderbilt 7-17 and 17 on the season, 2-9 and nine in the SEC. Texas A&M 15 and nine and six and five in the SEC. Uh, don't get your hopes up at all for, you know, Vanderbilt jumping into a quad three game. I don't think that's going to happen based on Vanderbilt season so far, but it's just a testament to what South Carolina did this past Saturday, um, being down by four points to Vanderbilt at halftime, winning that game by 15. So outscoring Vanderbilt by 19 points in the second half. And we've been saying it. All season long, Vanderbilt's not a team that's just going to quit. They're, they're, that's not what Jerry Stackhouse is about. He is uh, a coach that, you know, I don't know if he's actually coaching for his job. I don't I don't know if that's the case. He has a pretty good recruiting class coming in. Uh, Vanderbilt has the opportunity to do a lot in the NIL landscape, landscape. So I don't know if he even wants to be a college coach anymore, but he found a way to get his team off the mat and off the road to South Carolina. <clears throat> it's just a testament to the Southeastern Conference and how hard it actually is to win on the road. So, yeah, Vanderbilt won 74 to 73. Looking at this right now, Florida um, is up 62 to 45 against LSU, and Florida is the home team. And Kentucky's up nine to five right now um, against Ole Miss in Rupp Arena. So a lot of stuff going on right now in college basketball. And I, as always, I, I right right now you need to start looking at the top twenty five. And the Gamecocks are ranked eleventh in the country. Um, looking through this right now, um, Creighton's the number seventeen team in the country. They're up forty to twenty three on Georgetown. Oklahoma, the 25th ranked team um, at Baylor. Um, Baylor and Oklahoma are tied at 7 7. Uh, BYU is up 15 to 4 on Central Florida. Uh, BYU is 19th in the country. Wisconsin's up 11 to 8 on Ohio State. Uh, Wisconsin has one of the most interesting tournament profiles I've seen in a very long time because. They have a lot of quad one wins. I think they have 10 coming into tonight. Uh, we already talked about Ole Miss and Kentucky. Marquette beat Butler 78-72. North Carolina got upset. Uh, yeah, I see Craig. Craig's here in the chat. Uh, Syracuse won the game 86-79. to And look, I, I think that I don't want to say this in a way that's, you know, North Carolina fans are going to be upset, but I think that North Carolina is starting to get figured out. Uh, they were a team that went to the NIT last year after two years ago, going to the national championship and blowing a, a double digit lead. I think North Carolina is starting to get figured out. I mean, Miami who, you know, Miami was, was really, really fun last year. They went all the way to the final four and they were a preseason top 25 team and North Carolina won by three points. So interesting to see uh, Iowa State beat Cincinnati. Uh, Iowa State won by a score of 68 to 59. Iowa State's ranked 10th in the country, which is one spot ahead of South Carolina. Uh, continuing through the top 25 matchups so far, Illinois beat Michigan by 29. And maybe I'm living under a rock, but I did not realize that uh, Michigan has a a starter, maybe their best player that's not allowed to play in road games. I don't know if that's a NCAA thing or a Michigan thing, but that that's pretty crazy. Uh, Dayton um, ranked 16th in the country did beat um, Duquesne 75 to um, 59 Pittsburgh upset number 21 
Virginia 74 to 63. And then another final Indiana state, um, the home of Larry bird got upset 80 to 67 at home tonight. So, uh, absolutely, absolutely crazy night so far in college basketball. I feel like every single night is crazy in college basketball right now, but, um, that's, that's kind of your reset. We'll get to some of these comments on chat row here in a second, but um, we have John Whittle waiting in the green room. So I'm going to go ahead and let Phil take us to a commercial break and then bring John Whittle in. And we're going to talk a little bit about, um, Gamecock baseball and probably some Gamecock basketball stuff too. Hey everyone, this is John Weiss Jr. and I'm with the House of Hope of the PD, a faith-based ministry focused on homelessness and men, women, and children. We are so excited for the Evening of Hope, Jeff Fox, for the event on March 11th at the Florence Center. For general admissions tickets, please visit Ticketmaster. And if you're interested in table or other sponsorship opportunities, please contact me directly at 843 843- Six six seven nine thousand. Thank you so much for your support. God bless. Chicken cock originated in Kentucky, like so many other bourbons, and so the resurrection of it. You know, Paris, Kentucky. That's the county seat of Bourbon County. So much of this whiskey was being made in that Bourbon County, put on ships and barges and shipped down in Ohio, down the Mississippi, and got to New Orleans where it got distributed all over the world. And people kept saying, well, hey, I want some more of that whiskey from Bourbon County. And so that's how Bourbon Whiskey uh, got its name. And Chicken Cock originated actually in Paris, Kentucky, which is today Bourbon County. So we have John Whittle join us right now. John, it looks very peaceful behind you. It looks like a very nice evening in Columbia. How are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm wonderful. It, it, it is nice after uh, rain all day yesterday. Beautiful day today uh, out, of, out at Founders Park to take in a couple of innings of scrimmages. And now it's a, a nice night here in Columbia out on the back porch. Uh, I'm very, very jealous. As you can see, I don't, I'm not in fresh air right now. I'm stuck <laughs> in the house. Um, the entire house has strep throat. It's it's a ridiculous night here in Florence, but um, so I'm so happy to have you here. And before we get into baseball stuff, John, you've been covering the basketball team for a long time. I mean, you were there with the Final Four run. What what are you seeing right now that impresses you about this Gamecock basketball game basketball team compared to you know teams from the past? Balance, depth fight i mean willing to compete um you know they got so many guys who do so many different things well uh i mean for them you know i I didn't think that i would be saying this beginning of the year but i mean it started on the defensive end of the court and and how much pride that they have taken taken on on that end and you know i I was a doubter on on them defensively er, early early on uh before the season got going and you know they've they've proven me wrong with it with every step uh, from, from that standpoint, um, you know, I, I thought this team would be good offensively and they have been, I mean, they're not, they don't play fast, but they play very efficiently. Uh, but the way they play defense and the effort that they play with is, uh, is really what stands out to me. Yeah, John, it's, it's really funny when I think about on, you know, the Frank teams and I'm not going to go all the way back to the Dave Odom, you know, days of, of college basketball in South Carolina, but Frank was like big on turnovers and you don't see the Gamecocks forcing that many steals. You see more, you know, unforced errors by the other team. And I see that every single game and it, it's really fun to watch. Uh, th- I mean, Mike Morgan says the best. And I said this last night, you know, on offense, it's kind of a, a Rembrandt the way that they're able to, 
you know, score points and find ways to, you know, deter the other team and the way they get offensive rebounds. So it's been a lot of fun. And, you know, I know you see this conversation every day on the big spur. I mean, in simply tournament is what everyone cares about. And I think that it's some, at some times people feel like, well, they don't have the net. That means they're going to be a good seed. How, how would you respond to that? I mean, the net is a part of it, but, but fortunately it's not the only part of it. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, there's a room full of people that are sitting in there who evaluate where, where teams should go. And yeah, they're going to lean on things, but they also are smart enough to know that there's going to be outliers and outliers in both directions. I mean, it's not going to, it's not going to just be that, you know, the top teams ranked in the net are, are going to stay there uh, in the in, in from a seed line standpoint. You know, there's going to be teams that drop. There's going to be teams that jump. Um, so, you know, at the end of the day, like the net's just part of it. But the committee also has has some eyes, too. And every committee I've ever heard of, you know, is looked at who's playing well, you know, at the end of the season. And and that's going to to factor into it. They're going to look at it quality wins and bad losses beyond just, just the net. So, you know, it's, it's, it's just a piece of it. I mean, it's a big piece of it. I mean, I'm not downplaying the net and what it means to, to the committee because it definitely means something um, is, but it's a starting point. It's not the ending point. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's a big key point you brought up is, you know, they look at how you finish a season. And if you look at the net right now, every game is counted the same. And I said this last night, there've been over 4,600 college basketball games this season. And South Carolina has been a part of 24 of them. So when you look at those inputs, it, it kind of gets skewed there when you think about where the Gamecocks should be. And then the fact that they beat Charleston Southern by what was it, John four, I think it was four points or six. Yeah, it was bad. I mean, there were several bad wins. I mean, if, if you call, if you can call a win, a bad win, South Carolina had several bad wins in a, in a stretch there for a little while that really drained what they are from a, from a net standpoint. And, you know, I get it. I mean, there 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 are moments and games that are, are kind of frustrating. I mean, I pointed one out, you know, this past weekend when Mississippi State went on the road and took down mighty mighty winless Missouri and and jumped up nine spots in, in the net. They they went from I think it was forty four to thirty five. It's like why does that particular game move the needle for them that much like it's not like they jumped from 199 to 190 I mean they jumped from from 44 to, to 35 and you know it was a 20 point win and it was on the road but it was a 20 point win on the road against Missouri who hadn't who hasn't won yet so you know so, sometimes things don't make sense uh, but but you're right I mean South Carolina is just a very small piece of of what happens in college basketball and and the one game that you know you win or you lose is very, very is is just a, a blip on the radar for 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 all of college basketball you know I do expect uh, um, Texas A&;M who lost to Vandy to uh, to drop a, a considerable amount but you know that 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 doesn't happen all the time yeah, it's funny when you think about it because you know, Gamecock fans and look, every sports fan of any team in the country lives in their bubble. Like that's just where you live. And you get upset when the net changes, goes up and down. But if the Gamecocks had lost to Vanderbilt, to your point, John, like, yeah, they would have had a drop in the net. And thankfully they won by 15. And look, look we'll see what happens to Texas A&M tomorrow. If Texas A&M drops one point or goes up two points, I'm going to have a question for the net, uh, but we'll, we'll see what happens. I don't think that's, that's going to be the case, but John, I mean, at this point in your career and you've been literally John, I've, I've read your work for, it feels like 15 years, maybe longer. I mean, John, how long you been doing this? Oh, uh, seven. Um, yeah. The uh, the the uh, Kentucky game football season, uh, Norwood's game Thursday night. That was the first week I ever attended a practice as a member of the Big Spur. Um, the Vandy loss a couple weeks later was the first game ever in the press box, uh, full time since uh, 2010. Um, got a call on the way back from the Papa John's dot com bowl from Bill Gunter who said. 
man, I can't do this full-time thing anymore. You want to go full-time and I'll be part-time? I said, sure, why not? I'm already doing full-time work anyway. Might as well go ahead and get paid for it. And uh, so that's that's when, that's when I started full-time. But, you know, back in, in uh, 07, I guess it was, was, um, you know, when I, when I first started with the site. Which is, which is really cool for me because, like, Gamecock Baseball and John Whittle are just synonymous with each other. I, I mean, the way that you built up Gamecock baseball, and I think you have a big part in Gamecock baseball being what they are right now. I mean, I know you've never called a pitch. You've never, you know, done a lot of those things that the coach is doing. You've never swung a bat for the Gamecocks. But honestly, John, you've been a big part of this. And, and the Gamecocks have a big season coming up. And just talking about you starting in 2010, that you were a part, or 2007, really, with football, but you've been a part of some magical Gamecock baseball runs. And at this point, everybody wants to know, what are the Gamecocks going to do this year? Well, I, I haven't swung a bat, but let's not – I may have called a pitch or two in there. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> but no, I – I, I have been uh, around to see a, a lot of a lot of great moments. Few few moments I weren't so great, but a lot of great moments. Um, you know, I, I started really covering baseball to the degree that I am in in about 2009, um, and then obviously 2010 was was pretty special, and and there's been a, a lot of good moments. But um, but yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of this season, like I, th- I think that this team has a a chance to be really really good. Like people ask me all the time, you know, whether I think this is an Omaha team or not. Like I don't see anything that tells me that they, they don't have a chance to get there. Um, I, I think they do have a chance to get there. I, I don't, I don't think as we sit here today and I, I know we'll probably dive into a little bit more uh, late later on, but as we sit here today, like I can't sit here and say like, they're one of the best eight teams in the country. Like I don't think that they're one of the best eight teams in the country, but I, I do think that they're good enough to be playing in Omaha as one of the best teams in the country at the end of the season, depending on how things sort of come together, who grows up, how well they're playing at the end of the year. Like it, it's one of those teams that's, that's going to be, be in there to have a fighting chance. See, that's the thing that I don't think a lot of people realize. And it's the same thing in college basketball, like the final four, like nobody can predict it right now. Like nobody can, like there's too many variables that happen. And then in baseball, uh, it's not as fluky as a college basketball NCAA tournament, but you know, you got to get through a regional, then you got to get through a super regional. And, you know, it just depends on who wins, who loses in that super regional. And then guess what? You go to Omaha and you have the best eight teams playing the best b- baseball in the country at that point in the season. And all right, there you go. Let's go, let's go see what you got. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, so much of it is just about positioning yourself, right, to uh, to have a great chance there at the end of the season. It's about playing well at the right time. It's about, um, you know, having guys step up in big moments. It's about having a, a team, um, you know, the, that has that has the ability to to uh, to play really well at the end and play well enough throughout the season to position yourself to play well at the end, right? Like, you know, you can't just turn it on the last week of the season. Like Tennessee a couple of years ago was um, about one, one, of, one of the craziest stories I've seen. Like they were out of the NCAA tournament um, when when uh, Vanderbilt was coming to town. And then <laughs> yeah. they were down big on the, in that Friday night game and came back and won on a walk-off and then proceeded to sweep Vandy and just swept through the rest of it, like the, the rest of the, the rest of the regular season to not only make, make it into the NCAAs, but, you know, be one of the best teams in the country. So, um, you know, you've got to, you, you've got to position yourself over the course of the season to, to uh, have a chance there at the end. And, and I, I think South Carolina's team is, is good enough to be able to do that. Well, John, it's funny to me to think about, you know, that run the Gamecocks had in Omaha where, or the college NCAA tournament, I should say. I mean, John, how many games in a row do they win? Oh, I I need need to do a better know of no, knowing these things off the top of my head. It was, it was 20 something. It wasn't, I mean, it was, yeah, it was, it was was 20 something um, that, that they, that they rattled off in a row. It was, it was incredible. And so, John, I say that to just say that 
Gamecock fans might have been spoiled. I mean, because that was, you know, a decade ago, a decade and a half ago. And, you know, I, I remember all like the old horns and Gamecock football that remember everything. But there was that excitement level with Gamecock baseball because Gamecock baseball had been there before. They had, they had been to Omaha. It wasn't like, oh, wow, the Gamecocks might play in the SEC championship against Auburn in football. It was like, no, we're getting back to this. And I think sometimes the Gamecock fans get spoiled and I'm right there with them. Like, obviously we all want the Gamecocks to do as well as possible, but you know, going into this year, I think that the, the foundation is kind of laid when you have two first team all Americans. And I just want to get your take on like for somebody that's watching this show for the first time, you know, hasn't paid attention to Gamecock baseball since last year. If you could just kind of go through like, you know, pitching, fielding, batting, and you don't have to hit on every player, but what what should what should a Gamecock fan expect if they're going to the field to see him play against um who is it, Miami, Ohio on Friday? What what should they expect to see? Yeah, I mean if you just want to get up and, and go take care of the baby or, or something like that, I can I can answer that question for the next 10 or 15 minutes. So if, if you need a little nap, you know, go go for it. Um but yeah, I mean Though I, I think you can expect to see a, a veteran lineup um, over the that's that's going to evolve a little bit because there's so many guys who are capable of playing at a high level, uh, and I think you're going to see a pitching staff that has a lot of new faces. Some of the some of the new faces are young, but some of them are, are transfer portal guys and who are old, but they're new to the Gamecocks. So I think you're going to see some evolution on the pitching staff too because there's so many new guys they're trying to figure out, you know, who goes where, who, who does this well, who does best in these kind of moments. Like there, there's going to be some, uh, some, some time in the season where they've, they've got to figure that out. Like you do everything you can to, to, to replicate in, in the scrimmage, you know, what it's going to be like on game day. But until you're in front of 8,000 people on game day, you don't know really how, how folks are going to react. So I think there's going to be some, some evolution from a pitching standpoint because of new guys and from an offensive standpoint, position player standpoint, because there's a lot of different options. So, but you know, from a, from an offensive standpoint, I mean, you, you've got two All-Americans, first-team All-Americans to, to build your lineup around and Cole Messina catching and Ethan Petrie in right field. I mean, those those guys are going to hit 3-4 in the order with Petrie third and Cole fourth. Um, Parker Nolan's at second base. He's going to hit second in your lineup basically every day. Left-handed hitter transfer from Vandy. You know, I had a coach tell me the other day he's been the most consistent offensive player since the team stepped onto campus in August. So, you know, he's – he does a lot right there at second base. We'll tip it over at shortstop. Is I mean, he looks like a different player from last year. He was he led the team in batting average in the fall, and was was really really good, uh, both from an offensive and defensive standpoint. Maybe he hasn't had the best best preseason uh, from an offensive standpoint, but he's been solid defensively. Uh, Talmadge Lacroix over at third base still still nurse nurses a hamstring a little bit, uh, but he's been really good offensively. Uh, this this preseason and it's probably going to hit five in the order for you uh, on, on opening day uh, over at first base is oh, we'll get back to that one um, left field <laughs> left field and center fields uh, a, a little bit uh, a, a little bit up in the air right now but Dylan Brewer's uh, been the best guy on the team in terms of in terms of on base percentage you know he works walks he'll get hit by pitches he'll give you a quality at bat um, but he's, I think he'll start opening day in, in center field. And then Blake Jackson is probably your leadoff hitter over there in left field, scrappy guy. Uh, and I know Kingston was on the show with JC and JB and, and Phil earlier today and said that, that, uh, he reminds him of, of Blake, Blake Jackson reminds him of Blake or of, uh, Brett Gardner. Uh, from the Yankees, played at College of Charleston. So, you know, if, if you're familiar with him, that's kind of the, the profile on him. But left-handed hitter, scrappy guy at the plate. Um, but Ryan Bakes can go out there to left field. He's He may be he may be one of the top two or three most pure hitters on, on the team as a freshman. Um, so, you know, they've got to figure out a way to get him in there. Um, you know, Carson Hornig is, is trying to get out there. Evan Stone has started a bunch of games. Kennedy Jones was – Rated by D1 Baseball, one of the best transfers in 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 college baseball, and you know he's he's uh, he's struggled to to you know put it 
uh, just be blunt about it. Um, and, and then Austin Brindling was another big time transfer that they got out of North Florida. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's a lot of guys for just a couple of spots and, and, uh, you know, you can't fit everybody in there. So, you know, the, the outfields is, is, uh, you might, you know, might see a little bit of, of change from time to time, but then, then over at first base, you know, Gavin Casas and Tyler Causey are, are over there. Both are a little bit nicked up right now. Gavin with a, a thumb and, um, and, and Tyler Causey with a little bit of a groin. Uh, so those guys may not be able to, to play this weekend or, or play in the field, um, you know, so they're, they may have to put Ethan Petrie over there this, this opening weekend and let him play first, which opens up a spot in the outfield. So, you know, there's a, there, there's a little bit happening behind the scenes that may, um, you know, affect what opening day looks like. But, you know, I, I think Gavin Casas is going to be uh, largely your, your first baseman every day, uh, but Tyler calls, you could get in there. So I think that's, I think that spot is the one that is, most truly open in terms of like a position battle. Um, both of those guys have, have, uh, have some different qualities cause he's played a heck of a lot better than, than Gavin has leading into the season. But Gavin is, he showed a little spunk, uh, this year or, or this week, this, this past week, uh, played a little bit better here lately, you know, had 19 home runs, had a ton, has a ton of experience, um, is a better defensive guy, but, but Tyler Causey, man, he can really hit. So that's kind of the, uh, the brief rundown of, of everybody in the lineup. Yeah. Um, guys, <laughs> I definitely could have checked on the baby, by the way. <laughs> um, y'all, I just want you to understand what you have in John Whittle at the big spur. And if you're not a member of the big com, join it because John Whittle knows not just baseball, but basketball and football just as he, he, I would put him up against anybody in the country that covers these sports. So John, I'm going to give you a quick shout out because I, there, there are not many people that cover, especially college baseball in the country that could have just come on a YouTube show at 9 42 PM and rattled off all of that. There, there are a couple, but I, I'd put you up against anybody. So, well, nine forty two um, yeah. is just when I'm getting going. So we're, we're really, <laughs> it, it's it's hard for me to do eleven twenty on Monday mornings with uh, with JC and JB and Phil. Uh, not nine forty two is is much more my speed. So so we can keep rocking on the late night show. Yeah, man. Hey, anytime you want to come on, I'm, ha- I'm happy to have you. So I even I mean, for this. I did not. I did not. I should have. <laughs> um, when I shave, I look like I'm 12. But <laughs> um, well, somebody, anyways, somebody said uh, in, in the little chat box up there that I was looking like a teenager, which I really appreciated. That that was. <laughs> I'm gonna. I gotta go back and find that one and, and screenshot that. So I'm I'm old. So when somebody tells you that you look young, uh, you you appreciate it. Like you say, you look 12. Like I'm I'm cool with looking like a teenager again. Dude, you know what? I, I have a really good um, chat row here. Um, That's what Mike and all these guys call it on their show. Like, my chat box is amazing. They they get some trolls on their show from eleven to two, but I'm very thankful for the folks that 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 come that come on this on come on the show and watch it. And I say it every time. And people give me the most valuable thing they have they have, which is their time. And I appreciate it every single time. Um, so, John, really quick. Well, the, the issue is, is, is they've got a bunch of grumpy people who are watching from work and the people yeah. in your chat, the people in your chat box, they probably had a, had a, had a bourbon or, or a beer or, or whatever else they're doing. And they're having a good time. Uh, the, the folks, the folks in the morning, they're just grumpy. Well, John, I'll tell you, I don't do this live during Gamecock basketball games, football games, or baseball games. Like that would be, I mean, you've seen it on the big spur, like the game, the game threads kind of kind of violent sometimes <laughs> but yeah. well yeah that that's that's because they're they're they've had the bourbon or they've had the beer and they get pissed <laughs> off so so yeah yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've seen that in the game thread for sure i mean it's live or die by every play um so one thing that really struck out to me there john like when you're going through the positions um you know all across the diamond it sounds like the gamecocks have options and you know as far as you know, hitting the baseball, the Gamecocks were pretty daggum good at that last year. And they hit a lot of balls out of the yard. What is your expectation for, I'm not going to say like, you know, run scored per game, but 
do you think the Gamecocks have a good chance to get hits off most of these SEC Friday, Saturday, Sunday guys this year? Yeah, and and you know, just to touch on what last year looked like, like South Carolina was one of the best teams in the country offensively until they started getting hurt. And you look you look back at, at how they finished the season and it and it wasn't it wasn't good. Like South Carolina was near the bottom of the SEC in in league play in a bunch of offensive categories, right? So but they were one of the best in the country offensively before Braylon Wimmer got hurt. Braylon Wimmer was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. Like when Kevin Madden quit the team and, and, and right near the start of the season, lost some depth in the infield, didn't matter so much. When Will McGillis, you know, broke his, his wrist, forearm, whatever it was, like that hurt, but they were able to, to remedy it a little bit and they, they able to overcome it. When Tommy Shakroy went down for his hamstring with the hamstring, they were really stretched, right? Like, and then Braylon Wimmer went down with with his hamstring. And that was that's four infielders. I mean, yeah, you 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 dipped a, a lot and the offense struggled a lot. I mean, they had three, at least three guys, maybe three and a half guys who just weren't nearly ready to be productive offensively last year who were having to start every day you had your starting catcher playing third base for a couple of series in Cole Messina because yep. you know they they didn't have anybody else who could play and guess what that affects the pitching staff too and you know it was it was rough there for a while so you know it, yeah offense was the team offensively last year when they were healthy were really good if you were to just pull up the stats right now and look back at last year it doesn't look like it was any good at all I do feel like this team has enough depth to be able to uh, withstand uh, some some injuries. Now they don't have a whole lot of depth on the infield, so if you have four four more infielders go down this year, like last year, it's going to be a real challenge again, even more so than it was last year. But I do feel like this team has 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 some talented depth. I, I do feel like this team can can be near the top of the conference again in, in home runs. I mean, I do think they're going to strike out a little bit. Um, you know, then that's from an approach standpoint uh, as much as anything. Um, but they're going to walk a, a good bit too. And I, I think on base percentage is, is going to be high again. But I mean, there's, there's probably five or six guys who I think can can hit 300 this year. There's probably six guys who I think can hit six or seven guys who can hit double digit home runs. Um, like I, I feel like this team has a chance to be really good uh, offensively, and you're going to see depth in the lineup. Like last year when you got down to like eight or nine, you were you were just happy to get a quality at bat. Seven, eight, or nine, yeah. you were happy yeah. to get a quality at bat, and then. You know, this year, you know, you're probably going to see Will Tippett at least start the season in the nine hole. And yeah, if you think back to what he was last year, uh, that makes sense, right? He hit 182. It would make sense for him to hit in the nine hole. But he led the team in batting average in in the fall. And it, and I mean, Blake Jackson uh, was was close, but those those were the top two guys pretty far and away. And you know, if he's he's going to be hitting in your nine hole. So that I think shows you kind of the length that South Carolina can have in the order. Yeah, it's really interesting because Will Tippett has been brought up a lot, you know, last year. And, you know, there was some frustration. I mean, 182, right? Like the frustration is going to happen. But Jamie has been really optimistic about Will Tippett and just said, like, look, he's going to look different. He's not going to look like the guy you saw last year that could barely, barely fit into a jersey. And I've been following your stuff, John. I think that Will Tippett has an opportunity to have a great year. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. No, I'm I'm a Tippett guy. I mean, I I was last year too. Like, I because I knew how how bad his hand and his wrist were were hurt, and you know he played through a lot of that last year, and just you know he was already small and not really ready to physically compete against some of these, some of these SEC guys. And he was going out there and battling and, and doing everything he could with, with the injury. And, you know, he, uh, you know, he couldn't, I mean, he couldn't, he's a switch hitter. He couldn't hit from one side of the plate, but because of that. And, um, you know, he, yeah. I, I, I think he's, I, I think he's going to have a, a really nice season this season. You know, he's, he's solid defensively. Like I'm not ready to say he's as good as Braylon Wimmer. Uh, just yet, but you know, he's got, 
he's got some of those same traits. You know, I, I feel like he's, I feel like he's really going to be ready for a good year. I, I, I saw today on, on Twitter, there is a new, uh, a new kind of one of those, uh, uh, not parody is not the right word, but a, a, a new Twitter account called the 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 Tippet Tribe. So you know, I, I I feel I didn't make the Twitter account, but I feel like I could probably be president of the of the Tippet Tribe. So you know, it's uh, I I, I certainly feel like he's going to have a good year. Yeah, I mean, if if you're president, then Jamie Bradford's going to be vice president. And <laughs> and look, you know, if there are two people I trust with Gamecock baseball, it's it's you and Jamie. So. We haven't touched on pitching yet, but um, Phil, if we can hit a quick timeout, I want to talk about pitching with John here in a little bit. Can we go and hit one quick? Hey everyone, this is John Weiss Jr. and I'm with the House of Hope of the PD, a faith-based ministry focused on homelessness and men, women, and children. We are so excited for the Evening of Hope, Jeff Fox, for the event on March 11th at the Florence Center. For general admissions tickets, please visit Ticketmaster. And if you're interested in table or other sponsorship opportunities, please contact me directly at 843-667-9000. Thank you so much for your support. God bless. Chicken cock originated in Kentucky, like so many other bourbons. And so the resurrection of it, you know, Paris, Kentucky, that's the county seat of Bourbon County. So much of this whiskey was being made in that Bourbon County, put on ships and barges and shipped down Ohio, down the Mississippi, and got to New Orleans where it got distributed all over the world. And people kept saying, well, hey, I want some more of that whiskey from Bourbon County. And so that's how Bourbon Whiskey uh, got its name. And Chicken Cock originated actually in Paris, Kentucky, which is today Bourbon County. <laughs> So everybody, if you saw that Jeff Foxworthy ad that just popped up during the commercial break, if you're close to Florence, I would really encourage you to come out and and watch that show. Jeff Foxworthy is going to do a one and a half hour comedy show at, at the Florence Center in Florence, South Carolina. Um, and then he's going to talk about kind of his testimony and what he's done for the homeless population in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, Jeff Foxworthy has a nonprofit that he started. And he still goes there weekly and pays for a lot of meals for folks that are, are needing those meals. So it should be a really fun time. It's going to support a great nonprofit in Florence. And I would appreciate it if um, you have the opportunity to come out and, and listen to Jeff Foxworthy. I know I grew up on Jeff Foxworthy and I still have his 1996 album that I listened to with my mom in the car. He's, he's a hilarious guy. But um, getting back to John Whittle here, um, John, we have a new pitching coach. What is that going to look like for South Carolina? <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, it feels like it's been a long time coming. I, I've known Matt since he was at SMC 15 years ago, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we're Matt and I are about the same age and, and, uh, known him for forever, just from, from the baseball world. And, you know, he was offered the job. Um, back before Justin Parker, uh, but he was at Liberty oh, wow. and uh, yeah, he was at Liberty with Scott Jackson, who is a, a great head coach. And, you know, this is Matt's dream job. Like it, his dream job is not to be head coach at South Carolina. His dream job is to be the pitching coach at South Carolina. Like he's for, for him to have turned down the opportunity a couple of years ago, he, he just said it didn't feel like the right time. And, you know, it, it came back around for him a couple of years later. So, you know, Matt's Matt's in the spot where he wants to be. 
And that's a big deal, but you also have to be good at what you're doing, right? Like you can't just want to do it. I'd, I'd love to be the head football coach of South Carolina, but be terrible. I mean, <laughs> be an 0 12 season. <laughs> It'd be awful. Uh, so you have to be good at what you're doing. And Matt's good at what he's doing. He, he did it at Spartanburg Methodist. He did it at UNC Wilmington. He did it for a couple of years with the Padres. He did it at Liberty. He's got every opportunity to do it here. And he's a little bit different from from Justin Parker, a little bit more similar to Skyler. Like he is it's not that mechanics don't matter, but he's more about being an athlete instead of being being mechanical. Justin Parker was was very, very um, you know, nitty gritty, very, very detail oriented on what something should look like. And Matt's more about Matt's more about athleticism and what feels right and what works with your body. So they're a little bit different in terms of what what uh, what what they stress and what they believe. But I, I think Matt is uh, is, is going to be really good here. He's got a very challenging um, position this year because South Carolina lost so much and brought in so many new guys. And there are so few guys who who have a lot of credentials uh, on this on this team. Um so it's it's going to be a little bit of a work in progress to to kind of piece some things together. So John, if you if you think about the SEC and and this is what I, it's been ingrained in me since I was a little kid, you got to have a Friday guy. Hmm. And it'd be nice if you had a Saturday guy that was just as good as your Friday guy and then you know Sunday you can figure out what you need based on the series. And I'm not asking you if we if the Gamecocks have a Friday guy. But you can ask me that. John, do the Gamecocks have a Friday guy? <laughs> I've, 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 I've said this a few times, and, and I some people have told me I'm wrong, and that's fine. But I, I feel like this is, is pretty true. Um, I feel like going into the season, South Carolina has several Saturday guys. You know, last year I felt like South Carolina had multiple Friday guys in Jack Mahoney and Noah Hall and Will Sanders. And like they did. Of- and they All did. of those three were Friday <laughs> capable guys, and and I mean that's proven to be true o- over the years. So um, I think South Carolina's got a bunch of Saturday guys right now as, as we sit here today. Now I think Eli Jones can can have the makings of a Friday guy, and I think Roman Kimball can have the makings of a Friday guy, and we'll see what kind of step they take to to get there. I mean, Roman is going to take some time coming off of the injury and, you know, not having pitched in a competitive game since since June of 2022. Um, you know, Eli is, is you know, I, I think he can he can do it. Um, but, you know, he's he's got to go out there and, and, and actually do it. You know, his his velocity is ticked up a little bit. He's throwing strikes. I mean, he, he looks good. But, you know, and I'm not even saying that he's got to be Paul Skeens or, or Hurston Waldrop or, or something like that. But, you know, he's 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 got to take a next step and, and show that he can be be uh, a Friday guy, which I certainly anticipate him starting on on opening day. But what I do like about Eli is he's as competitive as hell. I mean, he is he's a bulldog out there. Uh, he'll fight you. You know, he's he's one of the nicest kids you'll meet when you're when you're off the field. And, you know, I'll, I'll share this. I don't know if I should. I, I'll share it anyway. You know, I was talking to talking to Matt um, probably. It must have been September. It was before, like, scrimmages had started uh, in the fall. And, you know, we were talking about Eli. And, you know, he, he said he said to me, he's like, you know, how, how, how tough is he out there? Like, he's been in my office. It probably wasn't even September. It was probably August. Um, you know, when they were getting to know each other over the summer, he's like, he's been in my office. I mean, he's a great kid. Like I I love everything he says. Like we, we have great conversations about pitching and I, I, I hear him. He said, but he's, he's so nice. Does he have that competitive edge to him? I'm like, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll see it. You'll, you'll see it when these scrimmages start, I, I promise you. And, you know, we had the conversation, you know, after a few scrimmages, like, yeah, he, he definitely does. But Eli is one of the nicest dudes you'll meet away from the field. And then, but when you put him on the mound, I mean, he's he's got that in his neck that you want to see. So, you know, I, I think he can be that guy. Uh, we'll, we'll see if his stuff plays up. Um, 
but you know, I, I think Roman Kimball has a chance to to be that too. Uh, Matthew Becker can get swings and misses like nobody else on the staff can, uh, at least from a starting pitching standpoint. Uh, Dylan Eskew goes out and solves people off all, all the time. He's very similar to to James Hicks, and there were times where James Hicks looked like a, a Friday night guy last year. So, you know, I, I think there's I, I think there's some ability out there um, for. For uh, for for these starting pitchers, but it's just going to be who's going to step up and show that they can be a, a, a Friday guy. We just kind of have to see it a little bit. And I think when you think about teams like South Carolina, Vanderbilt, you know, Kentucky, LSU, Florida, you go through the SEC gauntlet there. But there are dudes on every single team, like just absolute dudes, and. You know, you look through the non-conference schedule and maybe somebody has a bad day. But guess what? They realize why they had a bad day and they go and fix it. And when you have a coach like Matt, that's the pitching coach that, you know, based on what you've told me, seems to be somebody that's going to hold them accountable, but also say, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? You know, what happened there? And then reflecting on that and then figuring it out. I think that's where the Gamecocks will probably be by the time the SEC schedule comes along. I don't know what you think, John. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think there's some truth to that. There's, there's, uh, you know, I was talking to Matthew Becker uh, on the record for a story about about Matt, about Coach Williams, and you know, he said that he's helped me so much. Is he's helped me so much on the mound, but he's helped me so much from the mental side of things too. So, you know, I, I mean, I certainly think there's there's uh, that that plays a role into it, but. You know, like like we said, there's so many of these guys who are new. Like we haven't even really gone in depth on on what the pitching staff ex- is exactly going to look like. But you know, there's a dozen guys probably who who are who are new to this team, and it's just going to take a little bit of time to to figure it out. You know, even if you had Justin Parker back here, like it would take him some time to figure out what what this staff would be because there's so many new guys. But you know, this is Matt's first rodeo uh, with this team, so he he's got to figure out you know, not only the new guys, but the old guys too. So it's, just, it's gonna, it's not going to be perfect, you know, early on, uh, it's, you're, you're going to see some evolution and some change and you, you know, there's, I haven't written my, like, my, like my final preseason, you know, preview and prediction and all that stuff yet. But, you know, one of the concerns, if, if you can call it that, I, I guess that you've got with this team is that there are only so many guys who can give you some length. Right. Like, you know, Eli Jones and, and Dylan Eskew, Matthew Becker, Roman Kimball, like those are those are, are really your starters, your, your starting guys. And, you know, there's there there could be I mean, there's a couple of other guys who they've they've thrown a lot of innings who, you know, they've kind of tried to coach and train to be starters like Eddie Copper and a Tyler Pitzer and a, and a Parker Marlott, like all three of those guys are freshmen. But you don't have a lot of guys with like a starter pedigree who you feel good about going out there and giving you six or, or, or maybe even seven innings. Like those guys are few and far between on this roster. Like you're going to have, have to have some, some uh, bullpen arms who go out there and, and get you six outs instead of three outs. And it's going to be a lot trying to figure out who's, who's a guy who can get you three. Who's a guy who can get you six. Who's a guy who's going to get you nine because there's going to be um, a lot of games where you have uh, your starter come out in the, the fifth inning or so, and you've got to got to turn to multiple guys out of the bullpen. And that's what I think Gamecock fans still have, you know, great memories of Matt Price, you know, giving the ball in the fifth and he's going to finish the game. <laughs> and that that's hard to do in the SEC. And it's hard to do with what Matt Price did in Omaha. <laughs> And then they also have, you know, Gumby arms like, oh gosh, John, I'm blanking on his name. Who was the kid that threw um, against Clemson? Like, I uh, threw like nine innings in Omaha. And the, the chat row is going to crush me here, <laughs> but um, I'm blanking on his name. He was, uh, he came as a DH and then became a pitcher. Oh, Michael Roth. Yeah, Michael yeah. Roth, who just had like an arm that lasted for years, <laughs> he could he could throw a lot. Yeah, yeah, and and that that that, that was one of the like the craziest things about uh, about Roth was he came in swearing up and down he was a hitter, and 
you know, he didn't, I, I won't say he didn't want to pitch. He wanted to pitch, but he wanted to be a hitter. And, you know, Ray, he, I mean, left-handed hitter guy has some pop, can hit some home runs. Ray wanted him to be a hitter, but you know, they kept throwing him out for an inning for an out or, or however long it was his freshman year. And he just kept succeeding and succeeding over and over again. And I mean, obviously the story wrote itself after that. Um, so yeah, I mean, he was, he was obviously incredible. And one of, one of the cooler stories to, to see come along because, you know, he, he wanted to be a first baseman and, or a designated hitter and, you know, hit bombs. And, you know, that just wasn't, that just wasn't his story, but he was, he was the goofy guy in the locker room in the clubhouse and was that way from his freshman year to his senior year. Like he, he was, he, he's, he's one of the greatest to, uh, to put on the uniform for South Carolina in, in more ways than just on the field. Yeah. And one day, John, I'll get you on in the off season when there's, you know, it's the middle of July and there's not much to talk about. I want to hear about all these fun stories that you've been a part of and you've seen with these Gamecock baseball players, because baseball players have character <laughs> that, that, that is no <laughs> doubt. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll leave we'll leave it at yes for right now. You you aren't wrong. Yeah, so I, I I've been enjoying the Chin Music podcast by Chad Holbrook, and you know you were around Chad for a while, and you know sometimes I hear Chad talk, and then I hear Ray Tanner talk, and I can't tell the difference because they talk the same way. But um, Chad had some great stories about Whit Merrifield. I think he's going to have um a couple other guys, Jackie Bradley Jr. on the show here soon, and. And you've been around it all. You you've probably seen it all, um, but you know it's it's a really fun podcast. If you have have not listened to Chin Music yet, uh, so John, um, I don't want to keep you much longer. Um, you know the bullpen. We talked about getting those last six to nine outs in a game. How do you feel about the bullpen right now? Yeah, I got to pull up my roster because there's there's going to be a lot of guys who who are going to have to pitch out, out of the bullpen and. Um, you know, I really, I've been inter- interested, John. Actually, I don't mean to cut you off. I would give you time while you're looking that up. But Ty Good, who came from College of Charleston, you know, Chad Holbert guy. Do you think he's going to be a bullpen guy, or you think he's going to be a midweek starter? Yeah, they they like him much more out of the bullpen, and um, you know, I I don't know exactly why that is. I just know that they do. Um, so I I don't think you're going to see. Uh, I mean, you might see him in a in a start in a in a short burst. Um, you know, in a midweek game or, or, you know, if, if something odd just pops up, but I think you're going to see him, him more out, out of the bullpen. But, um, you know, I, I think as we, as we sit here today, now some injuries start happening, then, you know, all bets are off. I would think he would be one of the first guys that they would go to, but, but they like him out of the bullpen and, and, uh, he's certainly going to be one of the key key performers out of there. And, you know, Chris Veach is obviously one, but, you know, he's added a curveball to his, his uh, repertoire this year. So he's more than just a fastball changeup guy. And, you know, that's going to enable him to, to go more than one inning or, or, you know, I mean, he, he could be a guy who easily gets called upon in the sixth inning of a tight game in a tight spot and, you know, finishes out, finishes it out from there. Yeah. Um, just ride the arm if you can do it. <laughs> Right. And, you know, he's got that ability and they've been throwing him multiple innings in in some of these scrimmages. So, you know, Eddie Copper is really the first person who who comes to my mind uh, from is, is, a, is a bullpen guy uh, because he is he's been so dang good uh, this, this preseason. He walked a ton of guys in the fall, hadn't walked anybody here in, in, the, in the preseason. Um, you know, he might be a guy who they they start on Tuesday or Wednesday next week since there are two midweek games. But he's going to be somebody who largely this season comes out of the bullpen. And I feel so good about him uh, right now as, as we get in as we get yeah, into John it. Eddie Copper. That's just a baseball name, in my opinion. That's a I, baseball name. <laughs> I, I feel like you're right on, on that for <laughs> sure. For sure. And uh, I mean, Tyler Pitzer is another a really good freshman. Um, you know, when, when the fastball is coming out of the hand, good, he's 93, 94. 
Uh, slider can be devastating. Uh, Joey Wittig is a guy who's really come along in the in the preseason. He's another freshman. Um, you know, those those guys jump out. Uh, you know, looking at the right-handed side, um, Connor McCreary is one who's really intriguing uh, because he's a and and I'll and Tyler Dean both. I'll, I'll lump these two guys in together. Uh, but Connor McCreary and Tyler Dean, a transfer from Virginia Tech, both of those guys have 95, 96 mile an hour fastballs. Uh, McCreary's got an excellent slider. Um, Tyler Dean's dropped in a couple of really nice curveballs here lately. Both of those guys are, are ones who have had issues with walks uh, it, at times. And, you know, that's something to watch for, but their stuff is so good that they've got, they've got a chance to be, be really, really good uh, this year for, the, for this team. You know, if, if they can command their, their pitches uh, pretty well. Uh, Ricky Williams, I'll go ahead and throw in the, all, <laughs> the, the three guys who I think can make a difference who are, who are injured right now, but all three of these guys will be ready probably early March. Uh, but Ricky Williams and Michael Polk, and Jake McCoy, all of them have a little bit different stories. Jake is a freshman um, who uh, has has will we'll get his fastball up to 94. Uh, really good, really good slider spin rate on the slider. Um, he missed the fall with a with a back injury. Uh, he's starting to throw bullpens. He'll face lot. He'll face hitters here. Probably not next week. Probably the following week. And, and be ready to go in early March. Ricky Williams, I think, is going to face hitters this week for the first time coming off of Tommy John. Um, he's, he's looked pretty good. Michael Polk is the one who they're really excited about. You know, That's he's a the little, guy. That's the guy I'm excited about. Yeah, he's a little bit less than a year off, off of Tommy John, and he's had a he's, – he's, I don't want to call it a setback per se. He's had some delays. So maybe it is a setback. I don't know. Call it what you want. Um, he's it, the the recovery process just hasn't been perfectly smooth for him. Like he was supposed to pitch in a couple of these scrimmages and and just hadn't felt quite right. Uh, so he's probably an early March type of guy. But uh, they they really really like what what he has a chance to do um, out of the bullpen. You know, you start looking at lefties. Uh, Garrett Ganey is somebody who has. Uh, Really, really improved over the course of the fall. Um, you know, he started out walking everybody, uh, but then you know they they made him pretty much a one inning guy, and he just goes out there and 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 throws smoke and has has a real competitive edge uh, out there. Uh, he can be a late game guy, probably a one inning short burst kind of guy. Um, uh, Jackson Phipps has pitched better here this fall. Like he's been really good this fall. I've kind of written him off. Um, you know, prior to the last couple of weeks, but he's been consistently good uh, since since they got back from from uh, winter break. Um, been really good for the last month, so I'm not gonna completely completely write him off. Uh, Javar Martin is another freshman who led the team in the ERA in the fall. Uh, has really struggled um, here here in the preseason until his last two appearances. Uh, had a pretty good one today. On the whole, I mean, he gave up two earned runs, but you know, one was a it was a two run home run to, to Ethan Petrie that was. <laughs> I, yeah, that's I, gonna happen. <laughs> that that's gonna happen, but I, I'm pretty sure Ethan will tell you this. It, it was it was wind aided. It, it, it cleared the fence <laughs> by about a foot, and uh, the the wind kind of blew it out. On on most days, that ball's caught, um, you know, on on the track, not even at the wall. So, you know, he he had a pretty good day overall today. Like, there's pieces with this pitching staff, and you know they've got to have some good luck when it comes to injuries. Uh, especially when it comes to those guys who can give you some length, those four or five guys who can who can eat up five or six innings, like they can't afford to lose those guys. And I don't. And talk that's about what happened injuries. last year, John, with the starting pitching with all the injuries. All of a sudden, you had seventeen innings out of you know twenty seven that were gone, and then the Gamecocks had to find a way to piece that thing together. But they did, but because they had <laughs> they enough, did. they went to the supers. Yeah, they, they had enough guys. They had enough talented depth. They had guys like James Hicks or Eli Jones who were throwing like two innings or, or three innings who could give you five or six or seven innings. Like they they were in a position last year to where they could absorb some injuries. Like when Noah Hall went down, I mean, it was the next guy who stepped up. Uh, you know, when when Will Sanders was struggling, the next guy stepped up. When Eli Jerzenbeck went down, there was a guy ready. 
Um, you know, this team doesn't have kind of that luxury from from a depth standpoint. Like, <coughs> I remember having the conversation on the board last year. It's like, you know, we just can't have injuries. I said, well, you know, if there was a year that you could, it's this year. <laughs> And I mean, and that proved to be true. Like this, this is one of those years where you got to have some good luck and maybe they are having some good luck because Roman Kimball uh, had some discomfort and missed the mm-hmm. start. And Matthew Becker left his, his appearance, you know, this past weekend with some discomfort and both of those guys should be ready to rock here sooner rather than later. Roman, probably this weekend, Matthew, maybe middle of next week, but you know, they've gotten some good luck and some good news early on. And, you know, after what happened last year from a, from an injury standpoint, that that'll certainly be welcome. And, and I know you've probably got something to ask you. One, one of your, I think the guy, no, it wasn't the guy who said I looked young, but one, one of these guys over here in the chat box keeps asking about Ryan Bates. So I'm going to talk about Ryan Bates. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to ask you about it. (laughs) Yeah. Even though he's a freshman hitter, I'll talk about him anyway. Like, you know, he's, he's somebody who scouts have brought up to me in the fall. Like who, who is this kid? Where did he come from? And he comes up, he comes from like, near where JC does <laughs> but uh, up there. Oh, wow. and, yeah. Up, up there where it's way too cold for me to go this time of year or most times of the year. Uh, but the, the dude just hits, you know, he, he just hits um, what was most, one of the most impressive things to me in the fall was he had the fewest strikeouts on the team. And you don't see that from freshmen very often. You see that from guys who have been around the block a little bit and who have, who have, seen college pitching and who have, who are 22 instead of 18. And, you know, I think he had three or four strikeouts the entire fall. Um, some, something, something like that may have, may have been two, I, whatever it was, he had the fewest on the team. Yeah. And that's, that was, that was really, really impressive. But not only that, I mean, he's got some thump, like the ball goes out of the yard. Like, you know, when he's taking BP because, he he'll get it out of the yard. He makes barrel contact. Um, he'll, he, he gives you a, a good at bat. Like he, he's not shy about going the other way. Like him as, as most power hitters are like, he would prefer to pull the ball, uh, but he'll go the other way for you. Like he's just, he's just a really good hitter with a really nice swing. Like you don't always think about right-handed hitters as guys with pretty swings. Like those that's reserved for the lefties, right? Yeah. Like the, the pretty swings are the lefties, but, but he's got a really nice swing. Um, so, you know, I don't, I'm not sold on him as a catcher. Like he's going to have to grow a, a good bit to, to be able to be an everyday kind of catcher. But I think he, I think he probably has a chance, but he's good enough, athletic enough to go out there and play left field and be just fine. Like they're, they're going to be worse outfielders in the SEC than if South Carolina sticks him out there in left field, he'll, he'll be fine. Um, so his bat will certainly make up for any kind of defensive miscue, but, but he's made some nice, he's made some, he's made some very good enough plays out there. <laughs> uh, he, he'll, he'll be fine, but he's, I don't know if he's going to be every day because like we said, there's so many guys, but he's got a chance to be a lot of days, which is good for a freshman. Yeah. So you guys heard it here first. Um, Blake's is going to be the next Evan or Ethan Petrie. <laughs> So, uh, John Whittle with the scoop. We appreciate it. We'll see. We'll see. Yeah. I, no, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to go joking. quite that far, but um, <laughs> and partially because, you know, Petri had opportunity, right? Like, I mean, Dylan Brewer is your starting center fielder this year. Dylan Brewer des- deserved to be in the starting outfield last year. Dylan Brewer got off to a really tough start last year. Everybody else was hitting the ball. Dylan Brewer was not. So, you know, even Petri came off the bench in like the seventh inning of the first game and got a little single up the middle and, you know, did the same thing in game two. It's like, all right, well, this dude, let's, let's try sticking him out in right field. Never played the outfield before. It was always a, was always a third baseman. Never played the outfielder. I just go get your glove, go out there and do your best and hit the ball when you come up. <laughs> and that's, I mean, that's how and it you know happened. What? <laughs> So yeah, you know. and, and and Kingston's talked about that um a couple of times, at least on Inside the Gamecocks. He's told that story, which is which is hilarious because I think JB was giving a hard time saying, like, yeah, that old Ethan Petri, you didn't want to start him first game. And the Kingston was very <laughs> humble about it and just said, Yeah, but I started in the third game and you saw what happened. And 
you know, Ethan had just a magical year last year. There's not many true freshmen in the country that are going to do what, what Ethan did. So I say all that stuff about Blake's tongue in cheek, um, but it's always good to have an option, right? I mean, if the guy can swing the bat and he finds his way into the DH or into the outfield. And I mean, John, you've seen way more pitches than I've seen, you know, <laughs> you've seen more yeah. swings and misses and hits. Yeah. Well here, I mean, the, the thing is though, is, is Petri had those chances. Like, like this year it's going to be hard to get those chances all in a row. Like if, I mean, Gavin Casas could start every day at first base, but Tyler Causey might be the best power hitter on the team. I mean, he hits the ball further and with a higher exit velocity than is as as well as anybody. Um, Cole Messina is probably there with him. Like he hits, he hits balls like Josiah Seitler hit. Like, yeah, I mean, he's going to be some right. Like you know, Kennedy Jones is gonna gonna have opportunities at some point. Um, you know, Carson Hornig was your everyday DH last year. Like he's hardly. It feels like he's hardly in the conversation. Like there are so many guys who who uh, are, are going to get chances, but but Bakes is Bakes is near the top of the list. Like if if you were listing your top ten offensive players, like he would be in it. Uh, but you know, 11, 12, 13, they ain't bad either. So. Uh, it's, it's just going to be interesting to see how it all balances out. Yeah, before I let you go, um, Emmett Graham actually has a question here. I think you've kind of touched on it. I don't know how much you want to go into detail here, but do you feel like there will be a lot of guys trying out the DH spot early in the season? And, you know, baseball is such a situational game. So a DH is a unique position because you can pinch hit for what you need. So, you know, John, if you want to talk about that for a little bit, I'm all ears. Yeah, and, and another thing that helps Bakes out is the fact that he's a right-handed hitter. And it's not too often where you have too many lefties, but South Carolina might have too many lefties. And Ryan Bakes being a right-handed guy really helps him when it comes to, you know, situational things, whether it's to start start a game if you're facing a left-handed pitcher or coming off the bench, what whatever. Like, he's... That, that's going to be helpful for him because like most of these other guys we're talking about are, are, are left-handed hitters. So, you know, that's going to play a role for him as, as being a right-handed guy. Um, you know, Ty, if, if you were, if you were saying, okay, these are your starters, right? Like we, I, I feel like Blake Jackson is going to be in left. Dylan Brewer is going to be in center. Um, Ethan Petrie in right. Gavin Costas at first. Parker Nolan at second, Will Tippett at third, Talmadge McCroy at short. It, 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 excuse me, Will Tippett at short, yeah, Talmadge McCroy at third, and then uh, and then Cole Messina catching. Like those guys could be your starting nine every day. So then you look at, all right, who DHs? And to me, right now, Tyler Causey and Ryan Bakes are one A and one B options, and I think that those two guys are, are probably going to get the most at bats, but you hope that you can run up the score a little bit on Miami of Ohio and, you know, Belmont or, or whoever else those first couple of first couple of weeks and, and you get Kennedy Jones some at bats and you get Carson Hornig some at bats and you get Evan Stone, see what he looks like. Cause he, he can change a game defensively, but there, there, there's about four or five guys who you would like to get at bats in some capacity. But if you're just making out a lineup and saying who's going to be the DH, it's going to be a Bakes or a Causey when when you when you consider that other nine who's going to start, who are most likely going to be your close to everyday starters on, on the field. And that's why I think that this is a perfect note to end it on. Gamecocks have a lot of reasons to be optimistic about this upcoming season, and you know you got some non-conference games. John, I'm not going to do it to you. But, you know, the Clemson series is going to be a big one for a lot of reasons. Is there another non-conference um, non-conference series that the Gamecocks need to pay attention to? No. Yeah, I mean, I'm <laughs> right there with you. Hey, I mean, well, no, it's not like we're going to – or the Gamecocks are going to Texas next year like or right. having hosting Texas. I and mean, they right. will two years from now, but not this year. No, I haven't. I, I'm not going to lie. I haven't done a, like a real deep dive on, you know, any of these non-conference teams. I, I know it's, it's pretty weak overall 
Um, like last year, this time I was talking about like Penn is a good team. Like that South Carolina is going to have to really show up and play well to, to win all three games. And that proved to be true. And same with UNC Greensboro a, a couple years ago, like that, that proved to be true. Like I don't see a pin this year. Now that doesn't mean that, that, that Carolina can play crappy ball and go out there and expect to be nine and zero over the, the three non-conference weekends uh, apart from Clemson. Like there, I, I don't know what what it exactly is going to look like from from those three teams, um, but there's not one of those three teams that I look and say this is going to be a really big challenge. You've got to bring your A game every day. Uh, maybe it is. Maybe I'll figure it out um, sometime before before uh, this weekend. Maybe I'll figure it out sometime ahead of time. But as we sit here right now, like none of those teams jump out and make me, make me say, Oh yeah, pay attention to this one for sure. Yeah. And look, Whittle is going to be on top of this the entire season. I mean, I mean, Whittle seriously, since 2010, I've been living and dying with your game threads on the big spur. Uh, so, but Whittle, Whittle covers this thing. I mean, and Whittle had a really good point today and I go back and forth with John and Whittle. John, what would you prefer me to call you Whittle or John? Um, there, there aren't very many folks who call me by my first name, so, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. I, I'm going to call you John because I want to be different. But okay. so John, right. um, you know, looking at this season, the Gamecocks are going to be in the midst of almost every single weekend series outside of injuries, which you can't, you can't predict, but I want to thank you so much for, for coming on this show. I know that you're going to have absolutely more coverage than any other media person gives to a college baseball program in the entire country. And you had a really good point today on the board. You talked about how I wish that basketball and football gave you the opportunities to watch preseason stuff. Like you, I mean, you were there Saturday watching a preseason scrimmage, an inner squad scrimmage. So I mean, you've seen these guys and, so John, John has, has the, has the goods here and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you coming on the show. And I would love to have you on as many times as you're willing to come, John. Yeah. And that, that's one thing I wish more, more people understood about, about our job. Uh, people like, people like me who have to go out and, and, and cover these things, cover football, basketball, baseball, whatever, like we only get so many opportunities to see things like it used to be spring practice for football was totally open. You go out there every day and watch the entire thing. And there would be a couple of fall practices that were, that were open where you could go out and, and bring your chair and, and watch. And even if it was non pad practices, right, right at the start of camp, like you could go out there and get your eyes on things and and have a visual for yourself and see what things looked like uh figure out who looks good figure out what looks good Fig i mean it just what looks bad um you know you you were able to get a sense and now with everything is so locked up as it is especially with football uh, but but basketball too i mean they don't they don't open practice at all for basketball they they open it once maybe twice which is great it's really helpful um but when, when you have the opportunity to go watch, like you get a great sense of, of what expectations should be and, and how to paint a picture as a member of the media. So, I mean, that's why I'm able to talk about this so much is, is you know, I, somebody, somebody made the comment to me. Reggie Anderson made the comment to me the other day. We were at the football, football uh, transfer media day. And I was talking with Alex, who I, I know did a great job with you last night talking hoops. But I was talking to Alex. I, I said, you know, you'll you'll be at hoops doing doing the game thread and, and that kind of thing. And I'll be over at baseball. And Reggie said, man, you really love being at these baseball scrimmages. I said, well, I do. I do like it. But, you know, we also have the staff to be able to cover everything. So so let's cover everything. Let's let's do it all. But the the fact that you can go out there and watch BP. I didn't have anything to do this afternoon. It was beautiful out there. I went out there. I got out there about two 30 for a four o'clock scrimmage and watched them take ground balls. And I have a, I have a pretty good feel for what Ethan Petrie is going to be able to do over at first base, which is where he may start 
this weekend with with Causey and, and Casas both potentially being out or not able to play the field. And, you know, if if we got to go out and watch a football practice or, or watch an entire basketball practice, which, again, I understand why we can't, it'd be so much easier to, to give give folks on the Big Spur or Gamecock Central or Twitter or where the heck ever else that media covers sports be much easier to give give better insight versus you know just what we're hearing from sources or what what coaches and players are saying in press conferences be nice to be able to see some things with our own eyes but you know baseball's great um about about that leaving some things open leaving basically everything open and you know I I try to take advantage of those opportunities Absolutely John and it's one of those things where if I could go watch every basketball scrimmage and basketball practice, I, I might not be able to do what you do for baseball, but I have a really better idea that, that Colin Murray Bulls is actually really freaking good. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's one thing that has like come to fruition. Like, you know, you talk to sources behind the scenes and um, you know, in the build up to the season and you know, they'll, I mean, they were singing Collins' praises, and you know, we we wrote about that. A, I wrote about that a bunch on, on the Big Spur, just how impressive that he was, and how integral a role he was going to have with the team. But you know, sometimes it just doesn't come to fruition. And I'm not trying to put this dude on blast at all, but you know, we we wrote a ton about Elijah Caldwell this past off season from a wide receiver standpoint, and. You know he didn't he didn't make an impact this past year. Now that doesn't mean he's not going to be great next year and the following year and the year after that. But you know we had fans all primed for Elijah Caldwell to be a thousand yard receiver. It felt like, and it just it just didn't happen. And you know maybe we could have gone out there and seen a little bit with with our own eyes. And you know maybe we could, um, you know, not temper expectations per se, but, you know, kind of give our perspective on, on what other folks are saying versus what we're seeing. So, you know, it just kind of is what it is. And I understand why football practices are closed. I, you know, when the, sometimes when we had opportunities to go out there, every, everybody's filming stuff and, you know, charting plays and breaking things down like that. And, you know, I, so I understand why, why why things are closed up but but man it sure would be helpful if it wasn't <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean i think with what happened against with michigan and all their stuff like football is never going to be open again <laughs> but i remember those days that's how i met jc so um long time ago but um look everybody if you're watching this i encourage you you know go subscribe to the big spur like i'm i'm a i'm a small part of the big spur and like <laughs> I might do a little quip here and there, but John Whittle is literally, you know, he, he's the straw that stirs the drink, just like Michi or not, just like Talon Cooper in basketball. So, um, yeah, go, go check out the big story. There's always like promos and deals that are running and there's no better place to, to get your Gamecock sports conversation going than the big spur.com. And I'm only here on a couple of nights a week and a couple of night or a couple of days on inside the Gamecocks. John literally is probably up at 3 a.m. on the Big Square if you want to ask him a question. So, so go do that. But John, I can't wait for this football or this baseball season. I can't wait for the end of basketball season. And then football will be here before you know it. And just appreciate everything you do for us. We all appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Yeah, absolutely. Appreciate you having me. And, and, uh, you know, next time I'll, I'll break out the chicken cock whiskey and we can, we can have a drink while we do this. Hey, you know, I didn't tell the JV, I'll give me some of that chicken cock whiskey. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I do too. I need to, I need to get some as well. So that's, that's part of the reason why we didn't have, I didn't have it out tonight, but, but yeah, yeah I'll, so, I'll give JV a hard time about that. I'll say, Hey man, me and John are going to do this every Monday night. We need, we need, a, we need something better. Yeah, we might have to we might have to be Tuesdays because I'm I'm drinking bourbon by myself on Monday night after I post the VIP room. I, that's uh, when the I VIP out, room so. is awesome, guys. <laughs> like that's another reason to join the Bigs for. But John, have a great night. I'm sure that um I'll catch up with you soon. And got a, Gamecocks have a big basketball game tomorrow. When when are you leaving for that? By the way, probably around noon. It's like a five hour ride. Get out there a little bit early. Hang out. Get tip off at eight thirty. So. uh it, it it should be a fun night. I I love Auburn's arena. I 
I really like Auburn's campus. That's one of my favorite trips. So, so uh, definitely looking forward to that one. Yeah. Um, if we had more time and we don't guys, I got to go. We got strep throat all through my house, but um, John, again, thank you so much for being here tonight. And I'll, I'll close out the show here in a second. All right. Appreciate you. Take care, Matt. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Well, I don't know. I didn't expect all of this on tonight's show. John Whittle is absolutely the best in the business. He gave us, you know, going on an hour of his time and wow. The Gamecock knowledge that was dropped tonight, especially with baseball, is unparalleled. So I appreciate all of you for being here tonight. As you know, it, this never goes unnoticed. It never goes unappreciated. You know, you you guys and gals give me the most valuable thing you have, which is your time. And I'm so thankful to be on this journey with all of you. Gamecocks have a big game tomorrow night. Um, we'll see. Maybe, maybe if the Gamecocks win... Phil might be up for uh, uh, instant reaction, but we'll see. But thank you all so much for being here tonight, and I'll see you again soon. Have a great one. Bye, y'all.